When I was growing up, I was taught that we were the descendants of an Amerindian tribe. My grandmother would wake all her grandchildren at the stroke of six o'clock every Sunday morning so we could dress and attend church with her. She was just as insistent about us taking bush baths. Along with her reverence to the Catholic Church, my grandmother made sure we understood that loving nature and our surroundings was key to salvation. That there is much to learn from dreams, the lives of plants and animals, the flight of birds, and changes in the weather. These were the keys given to me by my guardians. The indigenous community has celebrated the Santa Rosa Festival for decades. It's kind of difficult for me to really honestly say that I have a connection with this statue or a connection with the festival anymore. I'm not too sure what she represents. It's sort of like the festival has become the thing that unites us, but it divides us at the same time. I am convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that it is by divine inspiration that I have accepted this call and take on this burden to ensure the preservation of our indigenous peoples up to this day. <laughs> Had it not been for a divine hand, I would have left this many years ago. I have questions too about the succession plans for this community. As it relates to the land and the model village, not every young indigenous native Amerindian person is going to want to come into that village and press cassava every day. My name is Tracy Assing. Valentina Medina, my great aunt, is Trinidad and Tobago's Carib Queen. And my great grandmother was one of the founding members of the Santa Rosa Carib community. I grew up here in the Royal Borough of Arima in an area called Mount Pleasant, also known as Harlem, on the banks of the Arima River. My mom's folks lived at the top of the hill and my dad at the bottom. They got together as teenagers and they can both trace their ancestry to indigenous peoples. Yeah, girl, Tracy. It's nice to live along the river. Yeah, I remember when I was growing up, you would take me for walks along the river bank all the time and talk to me about the fishes and the trees. Yeah, well, the river, as we know it, is about life. It's, you can't have life without water. Here in Harlem, most of my family still lives together, a very close-knit tribe. My cousins and I would roam the banks of the Arima River and the surrounding forest as children, fishing and hunting, learning how to plant corn and cassava, harvesting fruits, herbs, flowers from the forest. Now, my cousin's kids won't fish in the river because of the pollution. And houses have taken up the spaces where we would have made our gardens. Valentina Medina, who we know as Auntie Mavis, lives here. She was crowned Carib Queen in 2000. I've come to talk to her about being Carib Queen. I remember when I was growing up that Granny used to carry us to see the Carib Queen 
at her house all the time. Mm -hmm. And she would also go in and have private conversations with the Queen. Yes, yes, that happened. That still happens today? Yes, you see, if you make a promise, you take it to the Queen, she will bless that. Well, uh, the role, I'll go back to Central, the role of the Caribbean, August month. You have to see everything, prepare for that. That, that soup is for that feast. You see, I have to get flags, flowers, ribbons. We have to see everything in place. And we go to church on that morning, it's nine o'clock, and parade through the streets come back in the church for benediction and then for the Carib Center. And they will have their feast there. We have lunch. And after the people will marry themselves. The Santa Rosa Festival is held on the last weekend of August every year. It is the feast of Santa Rosa de Lima the first canonized Roman Catholic saint from the Americas. There are two stories as to how we started celebrating the Santa Rosa Festival here in Arima. The first legend suggests that three hunters came across this beautiful woman in the forest and they brought her back to their village. But she kept disappearing. They did this three times. And the priest eventually said, well, maybe what you have to do is construct a statue in her honor. This they did. And she promptly disappeared. So that's the first legend. The second suggests that the hunters actually found a statue in the forest and then brought it back to their village. I stopped participating in the festival when I was eight. I think even then I had some concerns about the story of the origin of how Santa Rosa came to be celebrated in the community. I felt like that story had more in common with what I was reading in fantasy stories by Enid Blyton. I think that by then I had also developed a sense that being indigenous had less to do with being a good Catholic and more to do with the sense of belonging to the land. Even Father Christian Pereira and medicine man Cristo Adonis have some concerns about the story of Santa Rosa. I respect the elders who participate in that. I would not tell them to done away with that. That is their belief, that is where they are comfortable. I don't feel comfortable with it. And I, and I hope that people respect me for the same way. People should not hold that against me because of the fact that I don't believe in it. I believe it's just a made-up story. I'm not sure how true or how false it is, but nevertheless, it was a story. And to understand the meaning of that myth will be more important than us, you know, discerning whether it is true or false. So the mission was dedicated to this holy woman St. Rose of Lima, who may have had some relations with the whatever deity or um, goddess the first peoples would be holding on to, but also because she was somewhat of an indigenous Catholic, a, a, a believer in Christ, who had some linkage with the native blood or the, orig the blood of the first peoples. And that would be a model that, you know, St. Rose has native blood. She's the first people. She is one of you. So you could believe in Christ too. 
At school, we were taught that there were two tribes, Caribs and Arawaks. The Arawaks were peace-loving farmers, and the Caribs were warlike cannibals. Both tribes were decimated by the Spanish. So on the one hand, we're told that we are Carib. And on the other, we're told that we were decimated. I would go home full of questions for my parents. Who were we really? I knew what the history book said, but I wanted to talk to some respected educators to find out if research had uncovered any new information. I went to see Dr. Basil Reed, lecturer of archaeology, and Professor Bridget Barreton in the Department of History at the University of the West Indies in St. Augustine. I think we need to redefine history because we often define history in the Caribbean as beginning with the arrival of Columbus, when in fact the Amerindians who were here long before Columbus arrived had a history of their own. We need to move away from this very narrow definition of history as being related to uh, historical documentation because we are talking about a period that goes back to 7,000 years ago in the Caribbean region. Trinidad was once part of the South American mainland and when the land separated the island continued to be fed by the Orinoco and Amazon deltas. There were several waves of migration of indigenous people dating back to thousands and thousands of years ago. The people who were here at the time of European contact um, seem to have been divided into several ethnic communities. But almost certainly all of them came from that, or their ancestors had originally come from that area of northern South America. And um, probably they all spoke a language from the basic language group, which we call the Arawakan language group. Certainly the people who were living here at the end of the 15th century included people who would have identified themselves with separate, different ethnic groups. And we know some of the names from the earliest writings of um, Spanish, English, Dutch, French explorers of the 16th century. Well, over the years, researchers have been using the terms Arawaks and Caribs because it's, it's really a function of convenience. But these terms don't mean much in relation to Caribbean archaeology. Uh, we can't go back into time and ask people what they call themselves. We have to um, create names based on where their artifactual materials were first identified. It was nearly a century after Columbus's visit in 1498 that the Spanish managed to secure their first permanent settlement in Trinidad at the old capital of St. Joseph. Later, Capuchin monks moved in, establishing missions for the conversion of the Indios. The church saw the expression of Aboriginal culture as the work of the devil. Cathedrals were built on the sites of the old native worshipping grounds. Native deities were replaced by Christian saints like Santa Rosa. Rituals and dances associated with previously existing gods were reapplied to Christian saints. Traditionally, historians have simply written them out of the national history. I am as guilty of that as anybody else. We have basically followed the narrative that um, the pure-blooded Amerindians disappeared. So we accepted that evidence as proof that basically Amerindians as Amerindians had no part to play in the modern history of Trinidad or Tobago for that matter. In 1592, there were as many as 40,000 Indios living on the island. These tribes were referred to by names including Taino, Yeyo, Kalipuna, Arawaka, Garini, Warao, Karina. They were gathered in missions controlled by Catholic priests. Eventually, in the 1780s, the last Spanish governor, Chacon, um, gathered together nearly all the surviving Christianized 
Amerindian people and gathered them together in Arima. So that's of course why Arima has been from that time onwards seen as the main center of Amerindian um, settlement and civilization in Trinidad. Only converted Indians were allowed onto the missions. Priests and bishops felt that segregation was the only way to prevent the converted Indians from becoming tempted by the pagan practices of the uninitiated. With time, residents of the mission were referred to first generically as Indio and then later as Carib. Later migrations of Indios were integrated onto the mission and they mixed with the converted Indians. Descendants of these people celebrate the Santa Rosa festival today. In 1974, the Santa Rosa Carib community was formed. Its main mandate was the upkeep of the Santa Rosa Festival. The organization's president and chief, Ricardo Barath, soon began to realize that there was more at stake. He began to invite descendants of tribes from Guyana, Suriname, and St. Vincent to make exchanges in the community. And we began to celebrate the Amerindian Day of Recognition on October 14th. Usually, everyone takes part in a smoke ceremony and a parade. I spoke to Christo about what the Day of Recognition means to him. I am not satisfied. I don't feel that it is, it is doing anything. I feel that it is only a show for people. That is my, my opinion. We should have our, the land that we have been asking for, whereby we can have a better, better celebration, not only for song and dances, but, but in a more educational way, with our young people being more involved. And um, the, the contingents that, that come to Trinidad, that, that they, 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 they only come for a, a little day or two, but workshops and so on, more discussions on spirituality and, and things of that nature. When I was a child, we used to go from house to house. There were no fences. And each of our great aunts prepared meals and sent dishes over to us. So it wasn't unknown for us to have as many as six different things to eat on any given day. And in return for that, we would run errands for them. And we learned to respect our elders that way. And they taught us a lot about the herbs, you know, always sending us for this leaf and that in the garden. We use all the different herbs. Fever grass is for fever. Diveven, when you make a baby, you drink the tea to get milk. And the chandelier, if you have the coal and your horse, you get the leaf and you pong it, you squeeze the juice, put a little salt and you drink it, and that will clear the throat. Her knowledge of herbs is one of the things that factored into Auntie Mavis being chosen as queen. Everyone has some knowledge of the use of herbs, but Christo Adonis is respected within the community and beyond it for his thorough knowledge of indigenous herbal medicine. People from different religious and ethnic backgrounds come to him for help. You come for quite a lot. Uh, you see, my role as a medicine person is, it is not only to give people medicine to drink and so on. It is to give people advice. Some people need um, healing because they have certain problems and so they come for quite a, a, a lot of different. Mm -hmm. But we use herbs not just for medicine as well, eh? no. we, we cook and, mm -hmm. and so on with herbs. There, if, if we look around, if we look around at say, and every, every herb that, every leaf that you see there, Creator has placed it for a purpose. If not for us to drink, but for us to bathe if not for us as human, but for animals, for dogs, etc. Um, look right around here where we sit. 
we call this this Christmas bush. We use this together with um, like DTP and other um, herbs to make medicine for fever and for cold and so on. This here, which is we call it deer meat, but we call it crepe. People use the end here to cook. They make what we call a bhaji with it. Right around us, right around us, there is the finest thing in nettle. We make a tea with that for kidney stone and so on. So you see right around you is medicine. Over there, by the um, fig tree, the banana tree, you see the laniboa. We use that to bathe. We bathe ourselves as people and bathe the dogs and things when we go hunting so that the animals wouldn't get our human scent and the dog scent and so on. There is medicine right around you as you look. Every herb that you see around has its purpose. Creator has placed it here for its purpose. Every herb. And it's important for us to, as indigenous people, to maintain that connection. And because it's a connection with the plant life as well. Mm -hmm. And it's part of our natural philosophy to be connected with everything. Yes. And hence the reason that we should, we indigenous people have to be more vigilant as protectors of the environment. Because if we allow people to burn down the place and thing, then one day we will lose all that. Because we are in twin with that. Our, our spiritual belief, our knowledge, we know that we were taught that Creator has placed us humans, the plants, the animals, and all of us here together. Because we make up the, we make up the world. Without, without one, it would be imbalanced. This is where my family is buried. My grandfather is buried here, my grandmother, my great-grandmother, several generations of my family. When the Spanish came, they found bones in people's houses and assumed that the natives ate people. But what was really happening is that they engaged in a form of ancestral worship so that when their ancestors died, they would bring the bones home. In fact, if they moved, they would take the bones with them as well because they would communicate with their ancestors using these bones. They would have smoke ceremonies, they would make offerings. It was almost as if that person never left. Today, if a member of my family dies, we go to the Catholic Church. There's a mass, there's a procession, and then they're put in the ground. There's no question about continuing that tradition. There isn't any special indigenous aspect of the whole funeral rite. I feel like I've lost my connection with my ancestors. I can't hold the bones of my ancestors. And that's not just a loss of a tradition, but it's also a loss of an important avenue of communication. Well, when I was a child, coming to the forest was like coming to a big school because it's a place where our parents would teach us all about the forest. It was like a place of learning. I have so many people who are afraid of the forest today. Like the first thing somebody says, if you say you're going in the bush, they'll say, so you're afraid snake. But I know that since you started taking us into the forest when we were four, it wasn't about fear. Like we never had a fear of the forest. Well, it was different with other people because of the lack of knowledge of the forest. So there was, the fear would enter them because they don't, they're not aware of the forest. But we know, we know the names of the trees, names of the fishes, names of the animals, the fruits, the roots, the grasses, the herbs. So it was like we were at one with the forest. And everything has a spirit. 
everything has a spirit and we, we believe that that is our teaching in order to be in harmony with all the spirits in the forest we must first be in harmony with ourselves and knowledge of the forest is what keeps us calm and knowledgeable it's so important for us to preserve nature and some of us have already put forward proposals to the chief on how we can preserve our old ways while preserving nature. On the other hand, the chief has proposed the construction of a model village. It's a plan that very few members of the community know anything about. To this day, none of us have seen his proposal. I, I'm sorry I cannot share the report with you. I don't think it's wise to share the report unless it goes to the minister and it goes to the cabinet and whatever. But contained in this report are many things that you spoke about, Tracy. And once the government accepts this and they put proper, proper systems and, and, and funding in place, we can do some of the things you talk about. The chief answered some of my questions during a public consultation on the future of the indigenous community, which took place in 2009. I decided it was time to raise my concerns about the way the Santa Rosa organization was being run and to follow up on proposals I had made to the chief about the future of the community. Part of a proposal I submitted to the chief um, was to really have the community center become an operational research center because you know, I, I, I spoke to him quite frankly and I asked him what, what his legacy was. Because as a child, I walked into that community center and saw artifacts and saw pictures on the wall and saw weaved baskets and mats, etc. And as an adult, I'm walking into the center today and I'm seeing the same things. And I know for a fact that many researchers have come and stuck cameras in people's faces and there's video around and there's books being written, and there's papers being written, and I want to know why a young person from this community can't walk into the center and have access to that information. I think that that's something that really needs to be addressed because there's more to us than the Catholic festival. The point I am making is that it is, it was the Santa Rosa festival that attracted me to this, and over the years, I would become educated. Everything will open up to me of who these people are, where they came from, and all the issues that surrounded the indigenous peoples would come. It did not start with indigenous peoples. So it was the Santa Rosa Festival. What I'm saying is, because of the festival, the remnants of the indigenous in Arima were able to survive. And today we have some semblance of it. The indigenous population is only recognized for the Santa Rosa um, Festival and at the Day of Recognition. That's when we get, you know, we, that's our two media days. Those are the days that the media and the national community pay attention. Another important issue I raised was that of accountability. I want to make it clear because you see plenty of people go away with the idea that Ricardo, who is the chief, is there for life and he's getting money and he's living off on that. My money comes from grating cassava. Facing the heat day after they're making cassava bread. Some of that sustains the community. Some of that sustains the community. I have to make it clear. Alright? Because plenty of people have the opinion that the funding that comes to the Caribbean community is so much and I am living in abundance, which is so far away. The chief declined to be interviewed for this documentary. I thought it would give him an opportunity to share his plans in more detail. Soon the Santa Rosa Carib community will have to find a new queen. The office of the queen has lost some of its shine and some of its respect over the years. 
and that has nothing to do with the queen. As far as figureheads go, there's the queen and the chief. The queen has become less of a figure of authority. Even though the office itself is a Catholic construct, the community has a long history of respected matriarchs. The community is now principally led by the president of the Santa Rosa Carib community, who adopted the chief title. Somewhere along the way, the matriarch's place has been diminished. The community does not support the queen as it should. I went to see Father Pereira and I asked him, where's the community? Where's that group that's supposed to? Rally wrong and, and look after their queen. I mean, because there must be, as I said, even with President Richards, there's a whole group of people who will make sure that when he has to go and speak, he has the proper suit, he has the proper car, he has the proper clothes, whatever it is, and he eats well before he leaves or he eats properly when he comes back. And all he has to do is to go and appear at a college so short or, or at a, some important function or whatever it is, so that the office of queen, our, the way we, we um, understand the office of our leaders reflects on how we look at ourselves. Even my great aunt, has some real concerns about the future of her office. Usually, the queen is asked to recommend someone for the position. I ain't seen nobody that will come forward. Hear me, when you're a Catholic, you have to be married, or you're single, you have got a boyfriend, they won't see you in your corner, Jack up by day. You have to be straightforward. You have to know to say the rosary because they will call on you to say a prayer. You have to defend yourself. They will call on you to say a little speech. You have to know something to say. They will call on you for all little things, right? And see how you're going, right? And if you're not so, he will tell you what is so, and it's so, and it's so. You understand what I mean? What you don't know, right? Our ancestors were written out of history. Finding out what our story is continues to be a work in progress. It's true that a few more books have been written, but Caribbean history remains largely under-researched. In some ways, the damage has already been done because most people believe that there are no true Caribs, because the only true Carib is a dead Carib. By making our way back to the forest, I feel like we've been able to touch something of the spirit of our ancestors. I go to the forest to look for guidance and to find answers. It's here that I feel most connected with the universe, with my entire family. We say we are Carib, that we are Amerindian, that we are Napuyo, that we are Karina. So that makes us indigenous. So on the one hand, we're indigenous because of our family history. But on the other hand, we also feel indigenous because of our love for the land, because we feel so connected to the land. We love the land, and the land loves us back. It's like the way we have respect for the river, because water is life. Nothing can exist without water. All known life needs water for survival. We believe that everything is connected, that all creatures, all living things, everything has spirit and purpose. And so if we believe we are connected, then how can we litter? How can we throw metal and plastic into the river. We have no desire to stand in the way of development. 
but perhaps land and human could learn to live together better. Perhaps we have to re-become native. Green mountain child. Green mountain child. It's a wicked and a wild style. Wicked and wild child. If you ever stand on top of Green Mountain Just take a look at the landscape And take a laugh at the mockery Civilization creates The soil is a tank at soon The grave of generations lost and past a fallen victim to lots of greed and intentions of lust yeah they throw us a party tell us drink and be merry While we dancing and we captivated by the music, we openly accept the